Steve. My wife and I have been blessed over the past few weeks to have uh, meals brought to our home. We've been overwhelmed, really, with all of the, <laughs> the food that you're often given when you have a new child. And I'm really thankful for it, really. <laughs> but, you know, I, people think that we don't know how to cook or something, I don't know. But I, I enjoy it nonetheless. I, I, I love getting meals from church members. We have, I think we're still on the schedule. I think Amy's still getting meals. We've had to put some of the meals in the freezer because we've gotten so many. And the, the, the neat thing is, is you know, our, our kids are so little, they don't eat anything. So we, we get all of it, you know. And we've, we've just, we've come to really appreciate the giving and all of the, the gifts it's just it's been a real blessing from the, the church folk up there in Wisconsin uh, but when somebody cooks you a dinner uh, or when you come over someone's house and you're you're you're, you're going in to eat what how do you measure a good meal from a from a bad meal I mean think about it you you go inside and you know they, they maybe they told you what you're having ahead of time but Usually, at least for me, I, I, I inspect the kitchen. You know, I, I want to go in and I want to see where the chef's working, you know. But what, what, what really, for me, what really makes or breaks a meal is, you know, when I, I start to, you know, smell what's going on in the oven, you know, what's going on in the pot, you know, give, give me a little something of that. And if, if I recognize the smell, you know, okay, we're, we're doing good. Hey, that's lasagna. It smells like pasta. Everything's good, but... Uh, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've gone into some houses and, you know, I, I, we were missionaries on deputation, and so I, I, I ate in a lot of homes. And there have been times when I've gone into a home and immediately walked through the door, doesn't smell quite like Mexican food. You know, they said that we were going to have tacos. Roadkill. <laughs> Roadkill cafe. You kill them, we grill them. No. Um... <clears throat> but uh, what what makes and breaks a meal? It's it's you know, how do you measure a meal? In my opinion, I measure a good meal uh, long before I ever eat it. You know, I, I measure it by by the smell. You know, but if it smells good, I'm willing to try it. But you know, especially you know, living in New Zealand for all those years, if I don't recognize the smell, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, 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 maybe I'll pass. I'm not quite hungry tonight, and I appreciate the offer, but I'm I'm a little sick and. Uh, we, we can give our excuses, but uh, we measure a meal by, by the smell. What about, uh, what about cars? Uh, imagine with me for a moment you could afford a sports car. I mean, a real sports car. I, I don't know, maybe you can afford one of those. Uh, I usually can and on Tuesday night's dream, you know. Uh, but uh, how do you measure a good sports car? What, what makes or breaks the deal? Uh, Porsche or... Lamborghini. For me, speed, right? Why? I'm not talking about a luxury car here. I mean, if, if you're getting a sports car, what what what's going to what it's going to come out down to is you know how, how fast can you get and how you know how fast can you get there? You know how fast can it go and how quickly can it get going? We were talking about Teslas, and Brother Lee was mentioning to me how how fast Teslas can be, and and the fact that we you know they put them in other cars just because they're so quick, you know. And that's that's a sports car, you know. That's what defines a sports car, and that's how you choose which sports car you're going to get. If you're going for something else, fine, you know. I mean, it, it, we talked about luxury vehicles as well. Well, that's a different kind of vehicle. But a sports car is defined by how fast it goes, and if it's not very fast, it's not really a sports car. Uh, in the book of Samuel, we were, uh, when, if you've read through that book, and, and Samuel is told by God, you know, I, I, hey, Saul's being set aside now. We're going we're gonna to start over now. It's time to choose a new king. Uh, Samuel, immediately, uh, when he gets to Bethlehem, well, he, he, he knows in his mind what, what a king's supposed to look like. You define a king, well, by stature, you know, you, if the guy's big and tall, strapping, well, then we're, we're on the right track here, but... Uh, he goes to Eliab, you know, the, he goes to the biggest brother, and whoa, here we go. And God said, no, no, that, that's not, that's not going to work. 
uh, okay, so Samuel, you know, he steps beside here and he starts to, no, well, surely the Lord's anointed is, is before thee, you know, and, and okay, okay not, not that one, a little lower, you know, and, and, he, and he starts, and he goes down the line until finally all the brothers, they, they've gone through all of them, and then the Lord says, no, no, that's how you define a king. But I define a king not by the height of his stature. I don't define a, a king based on his looks. I, I'm going to look at his heart. That's how I define a king. And that's how we should define our leaders, you know, not based on uh, what they look like or whether they're businessmen, amen. <laughs> but even though he's, he's doing a great job on the economy, Trump is. Uh, but we, we should choose leadership based on what kind of a person they are. A bank will... Uh, measure you, and they're going to measure you whether you you're worthy of the loan. Not, you know, I don't I don't care what you you promise. You know, it's, your your word is not your bond, according to the bank. Okay, your credit score is. Okay, your reputation as to whether you can manage money is is going to really make the difference on whether you get that loan or not. I'm sorry, you're you you can promise them anything you want, and so I, uh, when it comes to getting money. You measure a man by his reputation, by his history. Uh, employers. What about a, a, a you, you own a company, you know, you've got a good business going. Ask uh, Brother Waylander, what does he do? You know, what do you, how do you determine whether you're going to bring this guy into your crew, you know? He's strong, you know, he, he looks like he can do it. We'll just, we'll just give him a shot, you know. Here, here's all the keys to all of my buildings and... You know, here, and, and while you're out of here, go, here's a blank check. Just go take care of the, the stuff. I'm, I'm going on vacation, right? First day on the job? No, no, that's not. It's not going to work. You hire people based on references? I hope, if by nothing else, you're going to call a few references. But, you know, on their resume, uh, if it's put together well, you know, well, then we can maybe move on to an interview process. And then, you know, how they carry themselves. And then there's usually a probation period. You know, you, you earn that. But uh, there's there's all kind of things in life. But we we have a way we measure things, right? We 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 define things by by certain standards. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, there whether it be food, you know, uh, your bed. Everyone's got a different standard. Your your clothing. You know what what you buy as far as a suit. Uh, standards. We we measure things by by those and. Ha how do you measure a man? What defines a man? A person, you know, I mean, if, if how do you define someone? When you look at them over and you uh, begin to learn a little bit about them, what is it that you're looking for? You, you know, I was driving with my father in uh, Miami the other day. I was heading down to Miami Beach, and uh, my dad hasn't been, you know, he used to work in uh, computers, and he kind of still does that, but uh, part-time now, and he used to work in the Miami area. We hadn't been there in years, so it was kind of fun for us both to go. It was a little father-son time, and uh, we were driving down towards Miami Beach, and I couldn't help it. You know, I veered over to the left, and there, there were all those mansions. You know. There were all the, the buildings there, and you, you see that houseboat. And wow, you know, some of those boats, and we, we both here taking pictures, and oh, those are beautiful, beautiful homes. The architecture is just incredible. And uh, some of those, some of those structures, just immaculate buildings. It's really neat to look at. Um, and and those, you know, I'm I'm happy for those people. I mean, I'm glad they can have all those things. But you, you know, the, the the sad thing is that that's that's often how a lot of people in the world they they measure people by. You know, there there's a good portion of of, of Americans in our society where people are really defined by what they have and, and, and what they don't have. We, a lot of, and sometimes we're guilty of that. We, we measure people. Uh, you're guilty of it. I'm guilty of it too sometimes. We, we, we do. We measure people by, by stuff sometimes, by, you know, uh, where they are in society, you know, what, what they're, how they're able to contribute. Um, but, you know, I, I was looking at those those homes, you know, and I, and I and I was thinking about this passage, and I thought, you know, if if that's if that's what defines people, then then I failed. I I 
if, if that's the measure of a man, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. Because I don't have any of those things. I don't, I mean, we, my wife and I, we, we, I mean, we, we've got boxes, and we've got stuff that goes in the boxes, but outside of that, we, we don't have nothing. I mean, we've got a car, we were talking about the, the rebuilt title on it, and I found it, he's like, and he told me, what he, I was like, oh yeah, well, it's not nothing, but um, sometimes, you know, we, we, we're, we, we think we don't have anything, but actually, I, in, in a sense, I have so much compared to some of the rest of the world. But the point is, is that uh, if, if that's what defines a person, then man, I, I don't have it. If, if that's the measure of a man, then then I'm not doing so well. <clears throat> but, but you know what? I'm, I'm thankful that that's, that's not how someone is measured. I am so thankful that that is not <clears throat> what determines a, a person. And so, you know, if, if they want to have those things, I, I'm okay with that. That's fine. But what a person has is not a measure of who they are. A man's stuff does not define him. Christian, uh, you can have a lot of things. A, a person in Miami Beach and, and all throughout the world, they can have all kinds of stuff, but those things that they have have nothing to do with who they are. And they have nothing to do with who you are either. And you know, I, I believe at least that's what Jesus was trying to teach us in, in Luke chapter 12, in our passage tonight. If I believe Jesus was trying to make that point when he was uh, he was speaking to a group of people, and he, you know, they, they had been dealing with so many different things. And two two brothers they come up to Jesus, and um, their dad had just died, and uh, the older brother, you know, he he wanted to uh, maybe take all of the, the the wealth of his father. I it doesn't really say, but. The, for sure, one of the brothers, he, he comes up to Jesus. Jesus had become pretty popular in Galilee by now. He was really well known as a teacher, and he had a good reputation. And so whether these two uh, had any faith in the Lord is of no consequence. They knew that um, his opinion mattered. And so the younger brother comes up to him and he says, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell him to split it. It's not fair. He's taking everything. And Jesus looks at the brothers and he says, you know, who, who made me a judge over you? You know, of course, God had made him a judge, so it's kind of a rhetorical question. But, you know, God didn't send me here to, 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 to meddle in these matters. You know, that's not what I'm here for. But he uses this quarrel between these two brothers as an opportunity to teach a very important lesson to this, this huge crowd who had gathered to speak with him. <clears throat> In Luke chapter number 12, uh, he warns the two brothers <clears throat> who were fighting and, and bickering here, oh, oh, he warns them to be careful. He says to take heed, to be careful of always focusing on all of this, this stuff. You know, be careful. He says in verse, uh, in chapter number 12, I've just got to find my place. Verse number 13, verse 15. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness. He says to the brothers, take heed and beware of covetousness. What is covetousness? What does it mean to be covetous? That's in the law. Thou shalt not covet. You know, I, I've heard so many different definitions for this word. It, it's really, you know, you, you could just take your pick. But, but covetous, some have said, you know, uh, covetousness is wanting what you should not have. Right. Others have said that covetousness is a little, you know, a little more narrow than that. It, it's, it's not wanting what you should not have, but really wanting what you cannot have. God hasn't given it to you, he hasn't given you the means to get it, and so you shouldn't uh, desire what is not yours and what cannot be rightfully yours. Uh, but, you know, I, the funny thing is in the society we live in, that doesn't always play out very well, does it? You know, we, we're not covetous. Well, we have credit cards. So we can have anything we want. You know, so I, we don't have a problem with covetousness today in our society, do we? 
And we want it and we can't afford it, well, open a new card. I'm always getting things in the mail. I'm, I, I've always, I, I've worked very hard to, to protect my credit. And so I'm always getting things in the mail, you know, raise your limit. You know, you can, I, I, never, I never, why? Why raise my limit? I've never reached it. I'm, I'm limitless. I love it. You know, I remember years ago, Ryan's dad, he got a credit card. He's like, hey, free money. You know, this is Pastor Price. Uh, his father's a character. Um, he said, they gave me a credit card. What do these people think they're doing? <laughs> they gave me a credit card. He's walking around the Bass Pro Shop parking lot, T totally getting off track. Um, we, we don't have a problem with covetousness, do we? Not in our society. We can have anything we want. We can uh, go to the store. We can purchase things. If we want something that we can't afford, we just, we just put it on the card. So that's not covetousness. It's not wanting, it's not wanting which cannot have. I can have it. I can have anything I want. We talked about that this morning, you know, getting into debt, making right choices and wrong choices. People have the opportunity to destroy their lives just by going to the supermarket. And so I heard, I heard a preacher say this once, and I, and I really loved it. He said, covetousness, a good definition for covetousness, so it's not mine, I borrowed it. He said, covetousness is wanting more of what you have enough of already. Someone who's covetous, someone who is covetous, is someone who, who wants more of more stuff. Things that they have enough of already. And I thought, wow, what a good definition. Covetousness. And Jesus, as he's looking at these two brothers, he's, the brother's saying, hey, divide the inheritance with me. To Jesus, make him, make him split the money. Jesus, <laughs> that's not what I came here to do. You know, I'm not here to bicker, meddle in this bickering. And he looks at the men and he says, but beware. Be careful. Be careful of always wanting more stuff. Spending your life focusing on, on things. On more stuff. Always wanting more and more stuff. Stuff of which you have already enough of already. And the reason is, is because in the end of the verse, he says, in, in verse number 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And the, Jesus says the reason for that is, is, uh, is that life is not defined by what you have. Your, 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 God, your, your life is not measured by the stuff that you have and the stuff that you don't have. What a person has is not a measure of who they are. The, the stuff that you have, it's, re it's really not all that important, is it? He says, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. His life's not all about stuff. It's about so much more. And so how do you measure a man? If you don't measure him by the, the things that he has, if you can't uh, define a person by the stuff that's uh, in his house or the money that's in your bank account, um, how do you look up someone over and figure him out? To answer that question, Jesus tells him a story. Jesus uh, is very good at this. He's always telling stories. It, it, it helps the simple to understand and it blinds the, the, wis, the wise man. <laughs> uh, he tells the story of a guy in, in Luke 12 it, that he was a farmer. He's a, he's a pretty good farmer. I mean, if, if, if anybody was, was, uh, knew how to grow a crop, this, this, this guy was him. I kind of envision this, this, uh, this man as the type of person that if the university were to open up an agriculture department and they were to begin offering classes on how to grow a successful crop and, and how to become rich by farming, he would have been there in all the classes at the front uh, taking the notes and, and he traveled the world, you know, I, I can just see him traveling the world, visiting all the different uh, famous f farms all throughout the world, learning how to be a success, learning how to, uh, to develop his own crop to the best of his ability and uh, then finally the day came where he, became, he was able to purchase a farm and he, he grows a crop and it's, a, it's an instant success. He, he planned it all out. He 
did everything by the book, and it, it was a it was a hit. And as the years go by, that he had built some facilities to hold all of his crop every year. But as he uh, got into this business, and as he learned how to do it better and better every year, eventually this the storehouses that he built, the the facilities, he had them all organized and. But they got to a point where they couldn't hold the crop anymore. And so this man, he decided, you know what, I've, I've been growing, I'm doing so well. He, he gets it in his mind, he's going he's gonna to start over. He's going to build some new facilities. And before you know it, he's looking for architects, you know, and he's, he's going around pricing what it's going to cost to, to build these facilities. He gets the right guy for the job, and they're, they're going over the plans and how they're going to construct these, these buildings. Finally, the day comes when construction begins, and he's, it's, it's going fast. I mean, everything this guy did was just quick, you know. I, he set his mind to something, and he, he never wasted any time. This man was on top of it. Before you know it, the, the, the first facility had gone up, and they were already beginning to, uh, the demolition of, of the, the old one, that all of the grain was put into the house. I mean, he brings his, his, his sons in to tour the facility, you know, and they're, they're looking at it. You know, he's, he's explaining how all of this uh, has, has been because of his, all of his planning. He's, it, that was his model. You know, if you, you can have anything you wanted. You just planned right and you lived and you focused throughout your life. You can have anything you wanted. And he had so much, this man did. At the end of the day, uh, he goes home to bed. He was so proud. He talks, as before bed, he's talking with his sons, and he says, you know, I'm going to retire early, I think. I've, I've worked so hard, and uh, I've got so much grain here to last me for so long. I think I'm just going to uh, throw in the towel a little, a little earlier than I had planned. Uh, he, his vision for the future was bright. Just eat, drink, and be happy, and be merry. He's excited for the years to come for him and his little wife, and they could just live out their years. Why? Because he had so much wealth that he had uh, built up from his successful business. He lays his head on the pillow that night. He's out like a light, fast asleep. His wife comes in, as she'd done every night before, and she comes over to him, and she gives him a kiss. This time he, he didn't move as he used to move, you know. She looks over to him, and he's not, he's not breathing. Turns him over, and she immediately runs out, gets the servant. But by the time they come back, this, this man's dead. A day or two later, they have a big funeral. He could afford it. He had all the wealth of the world. They, uh, the, bro the, the sons come in, the, the wife, they planned it out well. Whoever was standing at the front doing the eulogy, saying, looking at this man, saying, you know what, here's a guy to follow. You know, he, he lived a great life. He worked hard. He was a success in life. Look at, look at him. And they were just praising him for all that he had accomplished in life. And then they all go home. The sons, they didn't hear anything. They were just thinking about the inheritance. And I often wonder if those were the two sons, you know. D divide. Let's divide the inheritance. <clears throat> but you know at the end of that man... That was the end of the rich man. And they, there's a lot of great things that were said about him that day. But at the end of the parable that we, we see in Luke 12 of the rich man, this is what God says of him. He says in verse number 20, he calls him a fool. The rich man, God said, that's a fool. Read with me the parable in Luke 12, beginning in verse 16. Jesus, he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. 
eat, drink, and to be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And so at that point, Jesus looks at the crowd and he looks over, everyone is listening, look, probably looking into the eyes of these two brothers. And he says in verse 21, So is he, so is any of you, that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. He says, this is the end of any person who lives their life for stuff. This is the end of, this is how it turns out for those people who, who measure themselves by the things that they have. And so, Jesus is warning us, what? Don't live your life for these things. And up to this point, everything has been for the crowd. You know, they've had this huge crowd um, in verse number 1 of 12, it says that there was a gathered an innumerable multitude of people. And so we, there's, uh, you, you can't even count how many people were hearing this. But, but now the, Jesus, he turns from the crowd and he wants to speak to his disciples. Because up to this point, the, everything has been for everyone. Now at this point, Jesus, he turns to those that are following him, to the 12 disciples, maybe some more. And he tells them, he, his, his disciples, he says, don't, don't focus your life on things. You know, sometimes we're tempted to worry about the material needs in our life. We, we, uh, we, everyone gets to that point, we wonder if we're going to have enough for tomorrow. But Jesus says in verse number 22, He says unto His disciples, He says, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. He says, don't spend your life worrying about things. That's what everyone else thinks about. He says, that's not how I want you to live your life. We can trust God to take care of us. You know that, believer? We can trust God to provide for us. He says in verse 23, he says, life is more than meat. He says, and the body is more than raiment. Jesus is saying that life is more than making a living. There's so much more to life than living for stuff. And it's not going to bring you happiness. And that's not how a person is defined anyways. We find life, real life when we seek the Lord. Look what he says in the latter part of this passage. He says here in verse number 31, he says, if you want to know how to measure a person, he says, focus your life on the Lord. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. He says, if we would just seek the Lord with our life, then God will provide all that we need. And you know, the, the end goal of all of this story is what we see at the very end of it. He says in verse 33, Sell what you have, give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in heaven that faileth not, where no thief can approach it, nor moth corrupt it. But then verse 34. Verse 34, I believe, is, is really the crutch of all of this. He says, focus your life on God and His kingdom. Uh, uh, focus, don't focus your life on stuff. Uh, yeah, live for the Lord. I'll take care of your stuff. I'll, I'll give you things. I'll give you all these things. But the measure of a man is not determined by his stuff. God doesn't uh, define you, and you shouldn't define people by what they have, and what they don't have. You, a person is defined by, and your life is measured by what you value most. What, whatever's most important unto you. That is what's going to define you. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was an illustration once of a chariot wheel. And how if you, if you study it, how a chariot wheel uh, is put together, the most important part is the center. Because that's where all the spokes are. But you take the center out, the whole wheel collapses. That's, that supports everything. And whatever you value most, that's, that's the center of the wheel. It's the center of your chariot. Well, put the most important thing at the heart of your life. 
And if you'll put the most important thing at the heart of your life, and you'll guard that, whatever you put there, everything else will flow to and from it. Everything else will, will focus on whatever you put at the very heart of your life. Because Jesus says in verse 34, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Samuel looked at the outward appearance. He was looking at the stature. He was looking at the height and the, the beauty of a man. And God, you know, we often look at people in our society, we, we, we measure them by their stuff. But God told Samuel, you measure them not by what they have or what they look like. You measure them by their heart. That's how you determine a king. And that's how you define a person. You, define, you will be defined one day when you stand before the Lord based on what's in your heart and what you have put at the center of your wheel. And so guard that, Christian. Guard the most important things. And everything else will work out. That's all I have for tonight. I'd like to. I, I don't. Are we gonna? Are we gonna have an invitation tonight? Or um, usually we don't on Wednesday. Uh, I hope you'll come back. We're going to be looking. <clears throat> we'll be in Luke again on Wednesday. This time we'll be back in chapter number eighteen. I hope that was an encouragement to you because I'm still learning about all this in my life. But um, I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and, and with that we're going to be dismissed. Next week, Pastor will be back. I think he, he asked that I preach the services because he's going to be so tired. Um, but, of course, you know, I don't know how he does Miami every week. I'm kind of feeling that right now. Uh, but I appreciate those of you that showed up tonight. And it, it's, been, it's been good to visit with you. And we hope to visit a little more throughout the week. Heavenly Father, thank you for, Lord, thank you for providing all the things that you do in our life. God, thank you for taking care of your people, for all the clothing and the food and all of the extra blessings that we have. For the, the cars that we have and the, the toys that we get to play with, the, uh, all the stuff. But Lord, we know that's not, that's not important. Lord, the, the things that are important are those that things that will last forever. And we pray that God, you would help us, your children, to just, just to remember that. God, it's so hard sometimes to remember and to look beyond the outward things. But we pray for your help with that Holy Spirit. We pray that you encourage us. I pray that you'd help us to use what we've learned throughout the rest of the week so that we might honor you with our lives. We pray all of it through Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.